Good morning, brethren, sisters, and church of the living God. Hello. It is still morning by me. It is 11.46 a.m., uh, the time that I've turned on the computer and going to be doing this. Well, today, Lord willing, also maybe this week, we'll see what the Lord will do. We are going to be addressing a very problematic thing with most of the Christians that you and I are going to encounter. Most of the Christians that you and I will encounter, dear brethren, um, have no idea or concept of what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Not, not all these Christians are like that, you know. For example, those who stem from the <laughs> Ruckmanites, okay, they at least have the proper concept of rightly dividing the word of truth. Meaning that, hey, things before the death, burial, and resurrection, doctrinally, were not written for us today. Instruction and righteousness, yes. There, a video that the Lord had me to do some time ago, uh, where we go through 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, um, an expository video on just the one verse, where we break down and examine what is instruction and righteousness. Um, I found it. <laughs> it was on the backup channel. That will be in the description box for you if you have questions about what is instruction and in righteousness, okay? We go through the verses of scripture that will be for you in the description box for you to go through if you have any questions about this. But a majority of the Christians that you and I are going to run into are not rightly dividing the word of truth. They think that the whole totality of scripture doctrinally blends together. And hence, when you do that, you have all kinds of problems. You find contradiction, apparently, with what Paul preaches and what Jesus preaches, right? You also find contradiction in the book of James and with Paul and stuff like that. If you do not rightly divide the word of truth, that is going to be a problem for you. Because you think everything blends together. Now, for instruction in righteousness, yes, that is there. To instruct us in his righteousness. You know, fearing the Lord, that kind of thing. Like I said, I found it. The video will be in the description box for you if you have any questions about that, okay? But rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? This, the authorized version of the scriptures, was written for me. Yes, but it's not all written to me, okay? The way a man was made right with God in the very beginning of the scriptures, uh, the Garden of Eden is not the way that they were made right with God during the times of the patriarchs. During the times of the patriarchs is not the same way that they were made right under the law. Under the law is not the same way we are made right today, okay? Okay. <laughs> During the time of Jacob's trouble, not the same as if we are may as we are made right today. Okay, during the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. Okay, all works. All right. Throw back to the very first dispensation and the seventh and final dispensation, eternity. No sin. Okay, no sin. All right, the seven dispensations. All right, the seven dispensations. But see, you have to realize, dear friend, the difference between what is doctrine and what is instruction and in righteousness. Like I said, we're not going to go through that in this video because we already did. The, the, script, the link will be for you in the description box. You have any questions, check that out. Okay. But we are going to be addressing primarily this week, hopefully, Lord willing, see what the Lord will do. Unfortunately, I might have to uh, turn my attention to a wicked heretic, prosperity nutbag who's harassing me, okay? But we'll see what happens with that. But we're going to be addressing the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be addressing the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is some of this is not going to be as in-depth as it could be because it doesn't need to be. But you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And see, a majority of the Christians that you and I, the ones that are in the buildings, okay, 
not all of them, because you got these Ruckmanites, and you got people who do understand. It's like, okay, all right, what's written on the Sermon on the Mount clearly contradicts with what Paul was saying in a lot of places. Why is that? Different dispensation, okay? You got to rightly divide the word of truth, all right? All right? You want, to, you want to see this in action for yourself? You run into a Christian that comes out of a church building. And recently that has been more of the focus for uh, apparently what the Lord is leading me on to. Is witnessing to these Christians who think they are, but they ain't. Okay? They think they are, but they ain't. <laughs> Alright? You want to get a, you know, like with the Catholic, for example. A Catholic cannot, but they're taught that they cannot know that when they die, they're going to heaven. They don't know. Why? Because if they say that they do know, like the scriptures tell us, that's the sin of presumption. So, if, like, for example, if you want to get a conversation going with a Catholic, always address the thing about, are you? do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Unto a Catholic, he cannot or she cannot answer yes. Because they're taught that's a sin of presumption. And you turn them to 1 John chapter 5. Okay? There are many other places you can go, but that's that's the one that gets them right. Like, really? Okay? Majority of these Christians that you run into, like the Methodists and the Presbyterians and all these people, oh, they love the Sermon on the Mount. Especially during this pagan Roman Catholic holy days, or helly days, excuse me, I should say, of Lent, okay? They love to go to the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, they love to go to the Sermon on the Mount. You know how you start a conversation with these Christians in the buildings? You know, the Lutherics, um, sorry, the Lutherans, the uh, German Catholics, okay? When did the New Testament begin? When did the New Testament begin? You ask one of these Christians. Now, like I said, I have run into a couple where it's like, I've asked them that. It's like, when did the New Testament begin? Uh, the one guy's like, with the death of the testator. It's like, really? You know that, huh? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we talked, and um, was he genuinely, truly saved? I do not know. Uh, but he read the authorized version. He understood rightly dividing the word of truth. He was for the redemption of the purchased possession. He had all his ducks lined up in a row and gave him a track. And he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll give this. He's like, you got another one? It's like, yeah. It's like, here, I'll give this to someone else. There you go. Okay. Not all these Christians. And by the way, I'm not a Christian. I'm of the church of God, church of the living God. Okay. But a majority of these Christians, brethren, that we are going to run into, you tell them about rightly dividing the word of truth. I, I've experienced this. They look at you as you just farted in their general direction. Okay? They do. They, they look at you like you're a heretic. Okay? But you ask them, when did the New Testament begin? With the annunciation. With the birth. Hebrews chapter 9. Remember this. Okay? Verses 14. On to verse 18. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, called the way of the cross, okay, not this, nonsensical Calvinistic nonsense, okay? Might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death, death, excuse me, of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, okay? Otherwise it is no strength at all while the testator liveth, okay? So right there, you ask one of these Christians that come out of their church buildings with their uh, nonsensible um, um, uh, hypnotic trance stuff that they're under, okay? Ask them, when did the New Testament begin? 
Okay, a majority of them that you're going to run into, well, with the annunction, with the annunction or whatever, or with the birth, okay? And they get real philosophical about it. It's simple. With the death of the testator, that's when the New Testament began. That's what brought in this dispensation, okay? That is what brought in this dispensation, all right? Because you have to remember, Jesus was sent to no one except who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. But we will be addressing that. We will be addressing that because we are going to be looking at the Our Father today specifically. Okay? But, but, when these people don't rightly divide the word of truth, they like to go to the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is beautiful. Lots of instruction and righteousness for us today. Yes, there is a whole lot of instruction and righteousness. But see, doctrinally, that is not for us today. That will be doctrine for the kingdom of heaven. Okay? All right? But first, let's go to Roma, uh, Romans, Numbers chapter 23. Please follow me along in the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along word for word, verse by verse at the scriptures that we will be looking at. Follow me along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Make sure I'm taking nothing out of context. If you have a question about that, pause the video and read the context on your own time. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. And besides, follow me along because sometimes I skip a groove. This blah, 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 gets going quicker than the brain sometimes, okay? Follow me along, all right? Don't just sit there, all right? You Christians, you look at me when I tell you about rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not for us today. You look at me like I did just fart in your general direction, don't you? And you think I'm the heretic for telling you to do what the scripture tells you to do. Don't you? Don't you? Then again, you got these Jesuit coadjutors, like the pastor over there, high at the Methodist church building. Okay? Jesuit coadjutor. Come on. Give me a break, pal. Trained by Jesuits. All right? Who, who say, well, that's heresy. You got also the uh, IFB guys with the Andersonites, you know, who you know, want to do away with dispensationalism. You know, even these hyper-dispensationalist twits, these easy believism heretics who say that they're dispensational, but yet they're saved the same way from beginning to end by half alone. And it's no, no, no. But we got to remember something about this, okay? Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Just one verse, okay? Just one verse. Numbers chapter, not 22, Brad. Verse uh, Numbers 23, verse 19. One verse. Okay? God is not a man, comma, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? God manifest in the flesh. Yes. Okay? God is not a man, comma, that he should lie. Okay? Let uh, God be true, but every man a liar. Okay? Let God be true, and every man is a liar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you've never told a lie before? Hmm? Oh, then you're God, huh? Right. Go away. Okay? God is not a man, comma, that he should lie, neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God never needed to repent of any sin. No, God can't sin. He never has sinned, never will sin. He can't sin. Things where he has changed his mind on, you know, changed, turned his mind away. It's like, okay, I was going to do that, but I, you know, you read it about that in Genesis uh, chapter 6, where he says, it repenteth me, okay, that <laughs> he didn't need to, he didn't need to repent of sin, okay, not at all. Genesis chapter 6, where he says, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. You see, repented, mixed in with grieved, okay, he was sorry that he made man on the earth. Okay? God doesn't need to repent of sin. 
Okay? And right here, if he says something, he's not going to go back on it. Okay? You, we do read in the scripture where if someone turns, he will repent of what he said he was going to do. Okay? We see that in scripture, yes. But when God says something, that's the way it is. See? Okay? God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Okay? All right? Now, also, Malachi, I wish you'd never had said that to me. <laughs> Malachi, Malachi, chapter 3, one verse. No, uh, verses 5 on verse 6. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Okay? See, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? God was manifest in the flesh, okay? God walked as man on earth. But unlike man, he never sinned. Even though Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, and that flesh was sinful, okay? But God within that flesh never sinned. Even though the flesh was the temptation, even but God himself can't be tempted. But the flesh could be, see. Okay, that's how that works. And of course, we addressed this in the previous video last week, where he kept the law perfectly. Hence, that sinful flesh was sanctified by him doing what no man could do. Okay? You, you get it? I know you get it. Even you idiots. And I'm being polite. My dear friend, you stupid bloke. Even you get that. Yes, you do. Refute that. Okay? But, I am the Lord. I change not. Hmm? And also in Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13. One verse. Verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13. One verse. Verse 8. If I can get there. Jesus Christ. The same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, let's read verse 9 while we're here in Hebrews 13. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So God himself does not change. But what changes, Brad? Right? The way God deals with people, that is what changes. He himself does not change. Okay? That's what you need to understand. See, because these people today that come along trying to bring you back under the Old Testament, Okay? And try to tell you that the Sermon on the Mount is doctrinal today. Salvific today. Okay? God doesn't change. But see, they're preaching another Jesus. What do you mean? Well, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Okay? These people that want to bring you under the law that want to tell you that the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for today. God himself never changes. Okay? God himself never changes. But what changes is how he deals with man. We read Hebrews chapter 9. The New Testament began with the death of the testator, which brought in the current dispensation that you and I are in, by grace through faith. Okay? You don't have to keep the law today at all. The Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Even when the Lord 
delivered the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't doctrine even then. Okay? It wasn't. If the Jewish people had received, accepted their Messiah as king, which they prophesied, it was prophesied that they were not going to. Okay? But if they did, that would have brought in the kingdom of heaven and hence none of this would have happened. But it was prophesied that it was going to happen that way, that they were going to reject it. Okay? But see, what these people are doing to you, dear Christian, okay, they are preaching to you another Jesus, okay? They are. One who is not, one who did not die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scripture. They're preaching to you a Jesus who is still on the cross, okay? God is the same yesterday, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, God does not change. But see, when you got someone trying to take doctrine that is for a totally different dispensation and make it relevant today, okay? They're, they're preaching to you another aspect of how God is, how he deals with man in a different dispensation, see? Okay? 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 on to verse 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity. Yes. Come to him broken of your self-righteousness. You're not a good person. You can't save yourself. He didn't die on the cross because you were a good person or that you were worth it. God so loved that he gave. Okay? Okay? All right? And what, what results? Well, God must have saw some good in me. I must have been worth dying for. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Okay? No, you weren't. That's the height of arrogance. Okay? That's the height of arrogance. All right? The simplicity is, come to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms. Come to him on his terms. Broken, contrite, and in fear of him, call upon his name. And may he save you if you do that. Okay? All right? Because he knows the heart. Actually, he does. Yes. It's simple. It is simple. But see, our pride, our flesh gets in the way. And when you have a Jesus, who is still on the cross, like the Roman Catholics teach you, um, then, hey, the, the, everything opens up. It's dependent on what you do. You keeping the commandments. You pushing a, pushing a rock up the hill, right? See, if you do not serve a res resurrected Christ, then... What do you serve? A Christ who is still on the cross. So many of these Christians who purport to believe that Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again. The resurrection. So many of these people, these Christians in the building, when you press them on that, they don't believe in the resurrection. Even though Astarte, Easter, is just around the corner in April. We, we serve a risen Christ. Do you? Do you? Do you really believe in the resurrection? Huh? Do you really believe? Why do you have to use hypnosis to get people into your church buildings? Huh? Why do you have to lure them through fleshly means? Huh? Because it's not of God. But let's continue here. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Another Jesus. A Jesus who is still on the cross. Another Jesus. Another Jesus who loves you unconditionally. And that's not true. You reject him. His wrath is for you. Okay? So, these Christians in the church building. They all talk about grace. Uh, once saved, always saved. But okay, when you press these people. Okay. Do you really believe in the resurrection? 
Well, I'm a Christian. I know you claim to be a Christian. Yes, I know. And you are a Christian, just like your brother Catholic is. Okay, but do you really believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? When did the New Testament begin? That's a commandment. Okay, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, that's a commandment. We're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. But see, these people coming along, especially during this Roman Catholic holiday season of Astarte, okay? Even though it's all about the death, burial, and resurrection they claim, they still serve a Christ who is still on the cross. They really do. And hence, verses 12 and on to verse 15, here in 2 Corinthians 11, but what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and they got the hundred thousand dollar pieces of paper on their walls from the Jesuits and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, Galatians 1, Galatians 1, verses 6 on the 10. Okay? God doesn't change. The way God deals with man changes. Okay? But he himself never changes. Okay? God is not dealing with us salvifically the way he did under the law. And when these Christians in their buildings, the majority of them that you and I are going to encounter, they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? And they think that the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for us today, okay? In other words, they're believing on another Jesus. Even though they say, Oh, of course I believe in the resurrection. I'm a Christian. Yeah, good for you, so are Catholics. So are Catholics. Yeah. Yeah, and they're our enemies. They are Satan's church. Okay? They are Satan's church. You're deceived. But Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 on to verse 10. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. God accepteth no man's person. And see, if you still have a Christ on the cross, God is an acceptor of person because you've got to keep the commandments, right? Or you're an elect, right? And the elect, again, is talking the way of the cross, the elected way of God. Not that you yourself are elect like Calvin taught. Heresy, okay? For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Uh, am I reading to you the right one? No, I'm reading chapter 2. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, Galatians 1, 6 on to 10. Excuse me. Excuse me. See? That's why I tell you to follow me along. I said one and you're like, Brad. Okay. Galatians 1, verse 6 on to verse 10. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, new creatures in Christ. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, go back to Galatians 1, all right? But though we are an angel from heaven, oh, maybe a one masquerading as an angel of light, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men? Or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And right there we have it. What do you mean? You know, Ephesians chapter 2, 
All right? Verses 8 on to verse 10. Takes you out of the equation. Nothing that you can do can merit your salvation. Okay? But see, the church buildings, they preach the love gospel. They preach, they preach about, you know, Jesus and all what he did. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But see, they, they put that to you in the salvific context. Okay? Okay, they do. They really do. And they are preaching still the crucified Jesus, even though they say they believe. I mean, you, you go to the church buildings. Oh, uh, one of the two, one of the two, oh, spiritual and temporal. One of the two big mamas to the Catholic are Astarte and Christ's Mass. Okay? People are going to be going to the church buildings because of Astarte. Okay? Easter. All right? And they're going to be saying they are they're here because he is risen from the dead. He is. But these Christians in these buildings, no, they don't believe in that. They, they say, they say with their lips, but in their heart, in their heart, they don't believe it. Because they go to the church building, they don't get chafed, they don't get offended, and if they do, they remove that one Jesuit preacher and put in another one because it's all about them feeling good. God loves you, and they have coffee and donuts and after the service, and it's it's a sham, people. It's a sham. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ, and that's what a church building is. That's what Christianity today is. Pleasing men. <laughs> okay, and, and this and some of these Ruckmanites too. Pleasing men. Okay? Who worship a man. Okay, not all of them. A majority of them though. Okay, not all of them. All right? It's all about man. Pleasing men. This Christianity today. Okay, and when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, it's all works. It's all works. It's all what you do, because in the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. It's all what you do, because you don't need faith when you can see them, O ye of little faith. Faith is mentioned only one time in the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's in the form of a rebuke, because when he says, O ye of little faith, meaning that I am your king, here I am. Here's the kingdom of heaven. You're going to take it? Of course, he knew that they weren't. But see, he's fair and just. He had to offer it anyway, or else he wouldn't be fair and just, right? Even though it was prophesied that they were going to reject it. Okay? Psalm 119, Zadi. Psalm 119, Zadi. What do you mean, huh? You don't know where that is? Huh? What do you read? The funny pages? You don't know where Psalm 119 Zadi is? Why not? Hmm? Why not? Tough guy. Should I tell you? <laughs> Should I tell you? Should I tell you the verses what Zadi is? Or should I make you look? Go look. Zadi, Psalm 119. Zadi. Okay, it's Psalm 1, it's verses 137 on to 144. Learn to, to read Psalm 119 by those things right there. Right there, okay? That's how you this that's how you learn Psalm 119. But Zadi, Psalm 119, Zadi. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. My zeal hath consumed me, because my enemies have forgotten thy words. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Yes, the words of the Lord are pure words, purified in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay? I am small, I'm, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. I am small and despised, yet do not I forget thy precepts. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. 
Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, because one of the arguments that will come against me for speaking like this about, about the Sermon on the Mount and the Our Father is that you're speaking against the words of Jesus. Uh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. But you got to remember, dear friend, a majority of what the red words are therein, a majority of them, not all of them, some of them do cross dispensational lines. Yes, they do. But a majority of what you read in the red words are not for, are not to us today. Okay? You have to understand that. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? All right? You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Because when you read the Sermon on the Mount and compare that with other things in um, the Pauline epistles, you're going to see things that apparently contradict unless you rightly divide the word of truth. And it's simple, okay? It's simple. There is a famine in the land of hearing the words of God. People are hearing Bibles uh, read to them all the times in their church buildings, right? Right? But rightly dividing the word of truth, an essential part of reading God's word, the authorized version of the scriptures, is not being taught. And when you tell that to people, again, they look at you like you farted in their general direction. You're the heretic for telling them to do what the scriptures tell them tell us to do. But 1 Timothy 6, verses 3, on verse 5. And these verses might be uh, addressed again when, uh, if I have to um, go and expose this wicked devil, this Ash, uh, Ash Cash guy. There, I said your name. I'm going to show you, if you, you keep messing with me, I'm going to give them your email. I'm going to expose you, you wicked devil lying charlatan, if you persist, okay? Okay. Probably egged on by my good friend from England, right? But whatever. If any man teacheth us or other, if any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, the red words, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Doctrine according to godliness. Okay? Doctrine according to godliness, meaning how to walk to please God in the fear of the Lord. Okay? Now, that is something that does cross dispensational lines, the fear of the Lord. Okay? The fear of the Lord. Godliness. Not being con uh, conformed to that. You read in the book of Revelation. You read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You read in the book of Isaiah. I believe it's Isaiah 52. About come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Under the law, after the law, and during the time of Jacob's trouble. About coming out from among them. The doctrine that is according to godliness. Three dispensations. Crossing dispensational lines. Godliness. Okay? All right? Godliness. All right? Godliness. That is not necessarily addressing salvation. But those who are saved to walk in that doctrine according to godliness. And we're going to address that a little bit. Verse 4, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Some people have leveled that to me, but it's to profit. Okay? Distinction. Okay? You want to be called a Christian? A Catholic is a Christian. Most people, when they think of Christian, they... Uh, they meld it with Catholic or the Joyce, Joyce Myers, which are Catholic coadjutors anyway. Okay? Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness or lands, properties, hotel rooms, or cars, or swimming pools, whatever. From such withdraw thyself. And of course, First Peter... Chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, okay? 1 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 19 on to 24. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God and your grief suffering wrongfully. Hold your place there. And of course, we've got to make this reference in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 12 and 13. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's continue back in 1 Peter chapter 2. What glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take in patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And then uh, right away, I'm reminded of Galatians where, um, where Paul asks, uh, where he says, uh, yeah, ye did run well. Um, uh, well, let's Galatians 3 verses 2 on, on verse 4. This only what I learn of you. Received ye the capitalist spirit, the Lord, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the capitalist spirit, the Lord? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Got to be there every Sunday. Make sure you give your tithe. Make sure you keep the commandments. Okay? Having suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and in uh, Galatians 5, verse 7 and 8, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Yes. For even, uh, we're in verse 20 again in 1 Peter 2. For what glory is it if ye, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well, according to the scriptures for the doctrine of uh, salvation for us today, and walking in that doctrine of godliness, of fearing the Lord. You want to learn how to fear the Lord? Read the Old Testament. Okay? Paul preached the fear of the Lord. Okay? Absolutely he did. Well, let's continue. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. What was his example of how he suffered for speaking the truth? Okay, that is how he suffered. Okay, that is how he suffered. And when you read John chapter 15, hold your place there in Peter, John chapter 15, okay, because you hear so much about this imitate Christ, right? Christ never sinned. Christ is God, the Father, okay? All right, so when you hear someone imitate Christ, Say, imitate Christ. Again, imitate is not in the scripture. What are they saying to you? Hmm? To be like God. Okay? The example that Jesus gave us about suffering for standing for God's truth. That is the example. John chapter 15, verses 18 on verse 23. If the world hates you, ye you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. John 7, verse uh, 6 and 7. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Today, yes. You have breath in your lungs. Today you could come to the Lord on his terms and he could save you. What are you doing? Verse 7. 
The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Why? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So see, when Peter here, go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, when Peter here talks about the example that Christ gave us, okay? For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Christ suffered, number one, for our sins, okay? But also he suffered by speaking truth and exposing the Pharisees, okay? And as we speak the truth of the scriptures unto people, that is the example that we are to follow of Christ. Paul is our example overall for how we are to please God in this current dispensation. But that example Christ gave us of suffering for doing what God, God commanded, okay, that's that example that he is talking about here. Because right here, verse 22, here's where we cannot follow Christ's example. And we addressed this in the previous video. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now see, you and I can't do that. We sin every day. And you say you don't, you're a liar, you're calling yourself God. The Lord rebuke you, okay? And no guile found in his mouth? I failed at that too. So have you. We cannot do verse 22. Even with the Lord living in us, we can't do 22. Okay, we can't. Okay? Neither could Paul. Neither could Peter. Neither can you. Okay? So, obviously, there's a difference between verses 21 and 22, isn't there? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. The example of suffering for God's righteousness, for what he said to do, for the word of God. That is the example that Christ gave us. And how to please God, to walk according to this dispensation, salvifically for us today, that is in Paul. Okay? That is in Paul. All right? And also, too, you do have to remember this. Peter was the apostle unto who? The Jewish Hebraic people. And Paul was the apostle unto who? Us Gentiles. Why do you think Catholicism likes to focus so much on their Pope Peter, which is actually Jupiter to the Catholic? Uh -huh. Because he was the apostle unto the Jews. And Catholics are replacement theology. Okay? But we cannot do verse 22. We can. Verse 23. Who when he, now this, we can. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now that is something that you, you know, when we're threatened, we don't have to threaten back. Okay? All right? When we are reviled, we don't have to fight fire with fire. That is something we can do. But we cannot do, uh, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. We can't do that. Perfectly, every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can't do it. But we don't have to revile when we are reviled. Okay? Okay? Uh, when we suffer, we don't have to threaten people. Okay? And all we got to do is, Lord, though, like a brother left in the previous video, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. That we can do. Okay? That we can do. Okay? Into thine hands I commit my spirit, or commend my spirit. Okay? Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Okay? And again, that we can't do. All right? That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Okay? Okay? Now, Go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's now, almost an hour in, let's get to it. Okay? Matthew chapter 6. We are going to address the Our Father. The Our Father who art in heaven. Okay? Now, this is a beautiful prayer. Okay? 
And the disciples, you know, uh, and other books of the scripture, which we're going to look at, it's like, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Okay? All right? And with this, you have to remember some certain things here. Okay? But see, the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for the kingdom of heaven. It's doctrine for the kingdom of heaven. And during the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord was offering the kingdom of heaven unto who? The Jewish people. There wasn't any Gentiles present during the Sermon on the Mount, dear friend. Okay? Okay? He was addressing Jews. All right? But let's, let's read. Let's read. We're going to read through first. Then we're going to dissect some of this, okay? Matthew chapter 6, 24. Uh, verse 24, wait a minute. What, what am I looking at? Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 on to 15. Okay? Let's read this first. I don't know why I was getting the 24 in here. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, who is he addressing there? Matthew chapter 23. Okay? I know I said that we were going to read it first and then dissect it, but we're going we're to dissect as we go. What is he? Okay? Verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues. There's a clue. And in the corner of, corners of the streets. That they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 23, verses 1 on to verse 7. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. What does that mean? Well, unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the uh, they had the Torah. They had the scriptures. They had the words of God. Yes, they did. But see, their talk didn't match their walk. Okay? Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And lo, the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Okay? So verse 5 in Matthew chapter 6, who is he clearly addressing? Scribes and Pharisees? The Jews? The Hebraic people? Okay? Let's continue. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay? Verse 7. But when ye pray, Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Heathen, hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed be the fruit of the womb. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of... Say, how many Hail Marys? You know, in this right here, <laughs> this <laughs> Saint Andrew... Bible Missal, they have prescribed prayers. The Hebraic Jewish people had a whole lot themselves of prescribed prayers. That you say this prayer on a certain day, you say this prayer on a certain day in this way. The Catholics, they go to their confession, you say, how many Hail Marys? That's vain repetition. It is not vain repetition for every day for the Lord to open your eyes to give you understanding, departing from evil, or wisdom. It's not vain repetition to pray for the good health of, health of a dear young brother, for the sanity of some, and for the deliverance and provision of, of others. That is not vain repetition. 
the vain repetition or the prescribed prayers of, say, Catholicism, also of the Jewish people, the, uh, the uh, scribes and Pharisees, okay, who put tradition above Scripture. That's what a Pharisee is. That's what a Catholic is, okay? So verse 7, when it says vain repetition, it's not vain repetition. For you to pray for that brother or sister you've been praying for every day for over a year. Okay? That's not vain repetition. The vain repetition is, example, Hail Mary full of grace. Say, ten Hail Marys and you'll be forgiven. Or some of the uh, rabbinic prayers. Okay? Alright? That they get in the Talmud. Okay? That's what that's addressing. Okay? Alright? And remember, he's addressing who? The Jews, the Hebrews. Vain repetition. Repeating a prayer over and over in an empty fashion. Mechanical. I say this, uh, name it and claim it. Your words have power, right? See? That's what he's addressing. But uh, Romans chapter 8, okay? Romans chapter 8. As I say to people, no man but the Lord Jesus Christ who is God our Father and the Lord is that Spirit. Nobody has the right to tell you how to pray except the Lord. I can't tell you how to pray. Okay? Or specifically what you should pray for. I could ask you, hey, could you keep me in prayer for this? Or, oh, brother, you know, prayer request. Amen, absolutely. Could you, hey, brethren, could you pray for me in this, for this, as ever the Lord will lead you to pray? Okay? If I say, hey, start praying this specifically, that this, no. Brethren, um, I have uh, bad health. Could you pr please pray for my health as the Lord would guide you? Okay? That's not vain repetition. But Romans chapter 8, verses 14 on verse 27. Okay? For as many as are led by the capital S Spirit of God, the Lord himself, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we call Abba Father. And also, uh, with that, uh, reference that with 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. And that's a capital S, the Lord. Okay? That we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Remember how Peter talked about, gave us an example of suffering, how Jesus gave us an example of suffering, right? Right there. If we suffer for him, with him, we will also reign with him. Suffer not of something of us, oh, I'm going out to suffer today. No, you'll do your suffering when you will seek to live godly according to Christ Jesus. Okay? You'll have your suffering. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yeah, because these are light afflictions. We have to remember that. Okay. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know, for we know, that the whole creation groaneth and prevaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, they're groaning too, the lost, but see, they're looking for that man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay? We're listening for the Lord to say, come up hither. Big difference, okay? 
And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. And the Lord is that Spirit, the seal of till the day of redemption, the Holy Ghost. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, the redemption of the purchased possession, right there in the book of Romans, okay? For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth uh, he hope for? And hope is the evidence of things not seen. Jesus Christ is our hope. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6, okay? Jesus Christ is our hope, okay? But is he your hope when you can visually see a Christ who is still on the cross? Well, we don't see him, Brad. Oh, no, but you sure do live as if he is still on that cross, don't you? Yeah. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience <laughs> wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit, capital S, the Lord himself, also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the capital S Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Okay? Okay? And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the capital S Spirit himself, the Lord himself, because that because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And you go ahead and read uh, verse 28. Go ahead. All right. So, okay. Okay. Paul just tells us about, you know, we don't know how to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself the lord himself will guide you into your, in praying have you ever had that happen okay you ought to if you're saved born again converted of the church of the living god right but now go back to matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 okay but when you pray use not vain repetitions as the heathen do for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking okay and the lord is the one who can guide us will guide us in prayer Okay? All right? A brother, like I said, might say, hey, brother, could you pray for me as the Lord would lead you on this? Hey, could you say some prayers for me, however the Lord will lead you like this? Could you? Okay? Yes. The Lord lead and guide. The Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Absolutely. Okay? Verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Okay? And my God shall provide, instead of uh, misquoting that, go to Philippians. Oh, uh, uh, where is that? Um, in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, but I have all, yes, verse 19 in um, uh, Philippians 4. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All your need. All your need. Wants are many. Needs are few. Having therefore food and raiment, let us be there with content. Okay? All right. Back to Matthew chapter 6. Verse 8 again. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. All right. Now, let's get into this. Verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Who is he talking to? Hmm? Who is he directly talking to on, in the Sermon on the Mount? He's talking to who? Come on, you know it. To Jews, the Hebrews. He is doing what? Offering them the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Kingdom of heaven, which is all works. All right? You would, that's why these Christians love the Sermon on the Mount. 
because it's all works. See, it's all, the Sermon on the Mount. I do this. I turn the other cheek. Okay, I do this. The kingdom of heaven is all works. Okay, that's what this doctrine is for. The kingdom of heaven, not for us today. Read it. It's all works. It's all works. Okay? And Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the works are talking, he's talking about, uh, about the law. Okay? And this is going to be the law during the kingdom of heaven, coupled with the law, you know, because during the kingdom of heaven, they're going to have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and stuff like that. Okay? Okay? Doctrinally, dear friend, dear Christian, this does not apply for us. He's talking to who? Jews. When ye pray, when ye pray, who's ye? Ye is plural, more than one. He's addressing Jewish people, the Hebraic people, the Hebrews taken out of Shem. Okay? Hold your place here and go to, where is that? Uh, Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Okay? Luke chapter 4. No, excuse me. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Excuse me. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 4. Okay? You're going to say, well, this is the same thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay? Luke chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 4. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection. The Lord was still offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews. You have to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Okay? Doctrinally. Doctrinally. This is still under the law. Okay? Go to Galatians. Go to the book of Galatians. you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 5. Before he died, buried, and was resurrected the third day according to the scriptures, he was under the law. The law was still binding until he died, buried, and rose again the third day, until he shed his blood on the cross to fulfill the law. How did he fulfill it? With the sacrifice of himself, the shedding of his blood to atone for your sins. That's how he fulfilled it. Okay? But while he was on the earth, before he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, Galatians 4, verses 1 on to verse 5. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Under the law. Do you understand? It was the death of the testator that brought in this dispensation, the New Testament. Okay? While before he died, buried, and rose again, third day according to the scriptures, the law was still binding. He was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people. Okay? Doctrinally, not for us. Verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And look up the word adoption in the scriptures. Adoption. Adopt, singular, does not appear. Check me out on that. Look where only adoption appears. And I'll leave it at that. Okay? But now go back to Luke chapter 4, uh, Luke chapter 11. So, verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us, teach us to pray, 
as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. Who's the us? The Jews. The Jews, dear friend. The Jews. And he said unto them, When ye pray, when ye pray, the Jewish people, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What kingdom? Hmm? This is before the death, burial, and resurrection. Hmm? Th thy kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom of God? The spiritual? No. What kingdom? Hmm? The actual physical, literal kingdom. Kingdom of heaven. Because this is before he died, buried, and res rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Okay? All right? Notice what is not here after verse 4 because it says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Something that is not here in Luke, that is here in what? Matthew chapter 6. Because number one, you got to remember, you got to remember that here, uh, this was, he went up to a mountain. This was a different place, teaching them to pray. Okay? Thy kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven. Okay? You can make the argument, well, the spiritual kingdom too. Hmm, maybe. But, I reckon it's more thy kingdom come because he had yet to die, bury, and raise again the third day according to the scriptures. He was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the children of Israel. Okay? But to pray. But to pray. Now go back to Matthew chapter 6. Okay? Verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, ye, the Jews, the Hebraic people. Okay? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 verses 13 and 14. But he... Now, a lot of people go to Matthew chapter 24 and say that this is, you know... Uh, you know, the, time, the great tribulation that the church of the living God, the body of Christ, is going to be going through. We are not going to be going through this. Okay, This is for the Jews. This is describing the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, But, verse 13 and 14, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endure to the end. Tells you for who this is for. Specifically, who Matthew chapter 24 is specifically written to. The Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, you and I, you come to the Lord on his terms. He saves you. You are sealed until the day of redemption, the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? Once saved, always saved. You do not have to endure to the end to be saved for anything. Okay? You do not. All right? You do not. Those who are going through the time of Jacob's trouble have to endure to the end to be saved because eternal security is not in the time of Jacob's trouble except for the 144,000 Jews. You have to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Okay? You and I today, we don't have to endure the, to the end to be saved. Because if you come to him on his terms, read Ephesians chapter 1. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? Alright? You're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? Once saved, always saved. We don't have to endure for anything. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. They're going to have to endure during the time of Jacob's trouble. 
which Christians call the Great Tribulation, which doesn't appear in Scripture. The Great Tribulation does not appear. Like the Antichrist doesn't appear. Okay? That Antichrist, yes, but, you know, people call that man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not in Scripture. But the, that man of sin, the son of perdition, the abomination that make it desolate. Okay? All right? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. What kingdom? What happens after the time of Jacob's trouble? You read Revelation chapter 19. The Lord comes back at his second coming with us who go up with him. And he come back down to do what? Establish the kingdom of heaven, the thousand year reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? See, before the death, burial, and resurrection, he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, which prophesied they were going to reject. He goes to the cross, fulfills the law, and make an atonement for sin by the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood he shed on the cross, okay? The kingdom of heaven has been put off for a while, okay? After his resurrection, he was, uh, you know, the kingdom of God, which is the spiritual kingdom, which also was primarily first offered unto the Jews alone. There was not any Gentiles in Acts chapter 2, dear brother, dear friend, okay? There wasn't. No Gentiles there, okay? It was to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But it was this current dispensation, okay? Okay? To the Jew first was offered the kingdom of heaven. To the Jew first was offered the kingdom of God, okay? So this kingdom that is going to be preached during the time of Jacob's trouble is the coming kingdom of heaven where the Sermon on the Mount will be doctrine. Do you understand? You have to rightly divide the word of truth. And um, Mark chapter 4, like I had said, Mark chapter 4, verse 17. Go to Mark chapter 4, verse 17. Okay? This you have to remember. You have to remember this. Okay? Mark chapter 4. What's the problem here? Come on. Mark chapter 4. Just one verse. Verse 17. Okay? Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 17. One second. Excuse me, I was reading my notes wrong. Matthew chapter 7, uh, 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Not Mark, excuse me, excuse me. Matthew 4, verse 17. Okay? What was the first thing that Jesus came doing? Hmm? In Matthew? From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? He was doing what? Offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews. Okay? Go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? When you read the book of Matthew, kingdom of heaven is always a reference unto the literal physical kingdom. Mark, Luke, John, where you see kingdom of heaven, okay? Yes, in context, that can be a reference onto the actual physical kingdom of heaven, yes. But more rather, it is the spiritual kingdom, okay? You have to remember that. You have got to remember that. And also now, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, what something changed, okay? Jesus, when he came, came what? He came what? When Jesus came here, he was what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was there offering the physical, literal kingdom of heaven unto who? The Hebraic Jewish people, okay? That's who he was preaching that to. But uh, what changed? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now, unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The king, Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. 
Okay? He was the king on earth, offering the kingdom of heaven. Okay? He came first. First, you know, his first coming, offering the kingdom of heaven onto the Jews. And Paul here is saying he is the king. Okay? And also in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verses 13 on to verse 16, Paul is address, calling Jesus king. And we all, even these Christians call him king. But I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witness a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who in his time shall shew, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So at his first coming, Jesus Christ came offering the kingdom unto the Jews. Okay? He died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, which brought in the what? This, the New Testament. He's up in heaven, okay? We are not building a kingdom today, okay? But Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords. We do serve a king, okay? But he is not on the earth right now, okay? He will be, all right? We're looking at this at showing you that Jesus as king, when he first came, was offering as king the kingdom onto the Jewish people, okay? And Matthew chapter 16 now? Matthew chapter 16 again? Matthew chapter 16 now, before the death, burial, and resurrection, verses 27 on to verse 28. For the Son of Man shall come in his glory, shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, verse 27, okay? The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Reference onto his second coming. But verse 28, that's interesting. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The triumphant em entry. That's what he's talking about in verse 28. Because some people have taken verse 28 there in Matthew 16 and have made movies about it, such as Highlander. That there are mortal people walking around, okay? That there are some people that are living from way back then that won't die until they see the second coming. No, no, that's nonsense. No, verse 27, he's talking about the second coming. Verse 28 is talking about when he rides into Jerusalem upon an ass, the fall of an ass. Behold, thy, come, uh, thy king cometh. Okay? Riding upon an ass and the fall of an ass. He rides into Jerusalem and they put the palm branches down saying Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the king. Okay? That's what verse 28 is talking about. Okay? But see, in Revelation chapter 19, okay? Revelation chapter 19, which I already made mention to. Revelation chapter 19 Verses 11 on to verse 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called, on 16, faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the capital W Word of God. This is the Lord Jesus at his second coming. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us! That's us! And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The sword coming out of his mouth is this right here is the sword of the Spirit. He's going to be speaking the words of God. Okay, he's going to be speaking. Okay, not this literal sword coming out of his mouth and hitting things. No, but the word of God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, so Jesus as King. Here, in Matthew chapter 6, 
offering the kingdom of heaven, the physical, literal kingdom, unto the Jewish people as king, offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews. So when he says in verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, the Hebraic people, the Jewish people, who he was offering unto them the kingdom of heaven. That's why here in verse 10, thy kingdom come. Okay? Thy kingdom come. Kingdom of heaven. Okay? See, at the time here, all right, he's offering them the kingdom. And he's telling them, hey, the, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Pray. Pray, you Hebraic Jewish people, that the kingdom will come, that Jewry will receive their Mashiach, the son of David. That's what he's talking about there. Thy kingdom come. He was offering it, saying, when ye, the Jewish people, when ye pray, pray, thy kingdom come, that the kingdom of heaven will come, that all of your nation, that all your brethren, Jewry in a whole, will receive the Mashiach. That's what he's talking about. You get it? Okay? Thy kingdom Come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Okay? Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, New Testament tie in. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Okay? Which we just kind of looked at. But we're, we're going to do this according to the way that the Lord gave it to me. Okay? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 on to verse 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am that with to be content. I know both how to, to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Okay? The Lord will provide for you today. Okay? He will give you means to make provision. Uh, he will provide for you through the body of Christ, as he does for us. Uh, for however means it is for you, the Lord will provide for you. But see, here in Matthew chapter 6, okay, the Lord as king, okay, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verses 6 on to verse 12. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Check this out. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. What does that mean? Faith to save them as, um, as if they were not under the law, which was faith and works? No. Faith in who? Their Mashiach. Their king. Okay? Remember, Pope Peter, as the Catholic will say, uh, denied him atrociously. Denied him three times. Jesus even makes a reference to Peter as Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? Yeah. But, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Okay? Do not ye yet understand Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets he took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets he took up? How is it? What are we reading to? Verse 12. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, which puts tradition above scripture. But what does this mean? 
where he says, Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets he took up? Let's look at this now in Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, verses 14 on to verse 21. Okay? What does this mean? Okay? Mark chapter 8, verses 14 on to verse 21. <clears throat> now, the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, oh, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not uh, remember? Uh, when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They sent unto him twelve. Okay? And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? You'll be like, okay, Brad, uh, back in uh, Matthew 6, uh, verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? What does this all mean? The Lord as king, supernaturally, from his power. What does he say? Um... When I break the five loaves among 5,000, it's like, look, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, look, the king will miraculously provide for his people during the kingdom of heaven. Okay, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be farming. Yes, he's going to, because the earth is going to be in bad shape, that kind of stuff. But see, he as king could miraculously provide for, for those his people. Okay? He could miraculously do it. Because he's king. That's why he's like, why don't you understand? I'm your king. I can provide for your need. For your bread. Okay, don't worry about it. While the king is on the earth, don't worry about it. Okay? He can provide for you. That's what that means. So when he says here... Uh, and the, the, our Father, give us this day our daily bread. He's like, I as your king can provide for you during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? He's going to command, you know, we're going to be farmers. But he's going to command that the earth bring forth abundance by farming. Okay? All right? As king, he's going to be doing that. Okay? And as, during this time where he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people, he miraculously provided for his people their bread. Okay? Do you understand? And today, as we looked at in Philippians, yes, the Lord can provide for you today, but not in the same way as when he is on the earth. Okay? That's why... We as the body of Christ, we are there to be there for each other, to for our needs, for fellowship, for loving one another and being there for one another, condescending to men of low estate. You know, we take care of each other through the body of Christ. But as king, physically present, you know, commanding the fields to bring forth abundance, right here in this context, while he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews, he was providing miraculously. Do you get it? Do you get it? Okay, let's continue. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay? Verse 13, now verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John 16, John 16, John 16, just one verse, John 16, verse 13, John 16, verse 13, if I can get there, one verse, 
How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And when he and he will shew you things to come. Hmm. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay? And go now to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Now see, as king, as king, he's going to fight the battles. Okay? He's going to go forth and fight our battle. And during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? All right? So when in here, and lead us not into temptation, the Lord is not going to lead anybody into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay? Deliver us from evil. Because during the kingdom of heaven, the thousand year reign of Christ, Satan is going to be bound in the bottomless pit. But evil because of man is still going to be on the earth. Okay? And he is going to be the judge. Okay? He is going to be the judge. They're going to have to go to the Lord for judgment. Okay? But go back now to John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 10. Okay? This right here is talking about the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the Lord himself. The Lord is that spirit. Okay? Today, in this dispensation, he saves you. He dwells within you. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. During the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to go to the Lord for judgment. Okay? He is going to be the one... Okay, who is going to, you know, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You're going to have to go to the Lord physically, personally. Okay, but today, in this dispensation, the Lord lives within you. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 10. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Knew him not, excuse me. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're making a reference on to our uh, new body, okay? And as he is, sinless, okay? A body that does not decay, all right? And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And our hope is who? Jesus Christ. Okay, we've already kind of addressed that. Uh, hold your place here. And 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Very simple. Not uh, Thessalonians. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Okay, so... Back in 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, the Lord, is pure. Deliver, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay? Yeah. All right? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. For sin is, tra is the transgression of the law. There you go. What is sin? Transgression of law. Verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. Okay? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? But that sinful flesh never caused God to sin. It's impossible. Okay? That's where you and I differ. We're not God. Okay? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, what abides in us as the church of the living God today? The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? So, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Okay? Now, there were Jews that did see Jesus Christ while, you know, he was alive and then the apostles afterward. Uh, the comma there, neither known him. Relational. Okay? Verse 7. 
Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, the Lord, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, verse 9. And here's where these stupid, sinless perfectionists come and try to twist this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He must be born again. The seed that remains in us is what? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is that spirit, will neither lead us into temptation or lead us to sin. Will he? The Holy Ghost that is in you will not lead you to sin. Okay? And when we abide in him, okay, we are doing well. But as we have discussed in the previous video, we can't do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not even Paul nor Peter could do. Okay? So what this is talking about, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And when you come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon his name, he saves you, you are born again. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the Lord seals you. He lives within you. So, for his seed remaineth in him. It's talking about the Holy Ghost. This is directly talking about the Lord that dwells within the saved believer. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So, verse 9, dear friend, is talking about the Lord dwelling within the saved believer. And the Lord, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit living in the new creature, the born-again saint. Okay? And he cannot sin because he is born of God. The Holy Ghost cannot sin. The Holy Ghost within you will not say it's okay for you to commit sin. He will not guide you into sin. This is talking specifically about the Lord dwelling within the believer. Okay? This has nothing to do with you being sinlessly perfect. It's talking about the Lord. Okay? Verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay? And those who do not, who are fake, as is addressed in... Um, 1 John chapter 2, they went out from us, but they were not of us. You know, the falling away, okay? They don't have the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus dwelling within them. Hence, those of the devil, see. 1 John 3 has nothing to do with our sinless perfection, but is talking about the Lord himself dwelling within you. And the Lord himself dwelling within you will not guide you into any sin. Okay, that's what that, uh, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things, that seal until the day of redemption. Verse 27 in chapter 2. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Once saved, always saved, sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? And ye need not that any man teach you. And the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. Okay? But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Okay? And when we're doing things the Lord's way, praise the Lord, things go well. But see, O wretched man that I am, we can't do that 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, dear friend. Okay? We can't. All right? All right? But see, this is talking specifically about Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory, and of course, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Um, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? During the kingdom of heaven, back in Matthew chapter 6, 
Okay? It's all works. All right? You're going to have to go to the Lord for judgment. You're going to have to, okay, you, what hope? Because you can see him. Okay? But see, today, as 1 John chapter 3 talked about, that is referring to the Spirit of God that dwells in the believer. And that Spirit that dwells within us of the church of the living God will not lead us into sin. That spirit that is within us warns us of that Asbury revival that it is of Satan. Okay? All right? Hence, the spirit of God and the spirit of the devil. That spirit of Antichrist that are in these that fall away because saved people don't fall away. See, you see how that works? Okay, 1 John chapter 3, dear friend, has nothing to do about preaching you being sinlessly perfect. If that were the case, Paul missed the memo. Okay, Peter missed the memo. John missed the memo. Okay, it's not talking about sinlessly, sinless perfection. It's talking about the Lord dwelling within the saved, sealed, born again believer. In contrast to that spirit of Antichrist. Okay? And you are not God. You cannot be sinlessly perfect. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Okay? Now verses 14 and 15, specifically in Matthew chapter 6. Okay? Now, this tells you what the whole Sermon on the Mount is about. Because, okay, we've looked at Ephesians, uh, easy believism heretics will even say, you're not saved by works, okay, it's by grace through faith. They don't say that, they, they say themselves by their own belief. But, okay, this is very telling. We saw in Matthew chapter 24, those who endure to the end, the same will be saved, okay? We don't have to endure to the end to be saved for anything, okay? But here's the thing about the Sermon on the Mount, about the Our Father here. And you read the, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they do this whole thing on the, um, on the Our Father. The whole, they do this whole, like, numerous chapters on each part of it, okay? The Our Father is about what works. So check this out. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father, Father forgive your trespasses. Now verse 14, excuse me, and 15 were missing from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 4. When wasn't it? Wasn't it? Which could lead one to say, well, maybe that's a reference unto the spiritual kingdom. Maybe. I think it's more for the kingdom of heaven because he had yet to die, bury, and raise again. But that's not the point we're getting at. Okay? You want to nitpick on that? Whatever. But what we are talking about is how this right here in the Sermon on the Mount, which is doctrine for the kingdom of heaven. Okay? All right? And they are being told uh, to pray for thy kingdom to come, the kingdom of heaven. A Jewish prayer given unto Jews. But verse 14 and 15 tell us specifically that if you don't forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. Okay? Now, easy believers and devil that watches this, what is that? Okay, come on. Come on. I know you hate me and I'm not too crazy about you either, you devil. But what does that mean? Come on, you can say it. What is that? That would be what? That would be a work, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? And it's faith alone during the kingdom of heaven? No, it's all works. You don't need faith when you can see the God. But see, verse 14 and 15 specifically. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's a work, Jack. See, today... You don't have to forgive someone and still go to heaven. Because if you go to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon his name and he saves you. You're once saved, always saved, sealed until the day of redemption. Okay? You're going to go to heaven. All right? Nothing is... You can't lose what isn't yours to lose. It is... 
Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, 8 on the 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, on two good works, not to save ourselves, or stay saved, being ambassadors for Christ, okay? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them! Okay? All right? Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verses 30 on to verse 33. Okay? What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness and not attained to the law of righteousness, wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. And the law is not of faith. Okay? You read that in Galatians, okay? But as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And of course, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7. Okay, are you, are you seeing a difference here? Okay, see, someone who believes that the Sermon on the Mount is doctrinal for us today will say, unless you forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. So then your forgiveness is based upon what you do. And we are looking at verses that tell us that our salvation has nothing to do with what we do. But by his grace, through his faith, through our faith, his grace, through our faith. Okay? All right? So we have a contradiction here then, don't we, Christian? Come on, you can admit it. Yes, we do, don't we? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 7. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good, to be ready to every good work. And that's why we pray for uh, people so that we can leave a peaceful, full, peaceable and quiet life as ambassadors for Christ. Okay? But when you have a government like this uh, American government that is controlled by the Jesuits, uh -uh. No, we don't pray for that. We pray that the Lord keep them off of us so that we can do what he has called us to do because the Titanic is going down, okay? But let's continue. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, shewing all meekness unto all men. And that does not mean that we withhold truth from someone, okay? These Christians in the building, they, 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 they love them into the kingdom. We don't want to scare them. You want to show love to someone, you tell them the truth. And that truth, like it says here in Hebrews chapter 4, um, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, soul, spirit, and body, joints and marrow, a person, okay? And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, you know, you want to show love to someone, you tell them the truth. And the truth hurts before it's a glory. Okay? But we don't go in like a bull in a china shop and force it down their throats. Okay? For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's a work right there, Jack. Come on, isn't it? But we see right here, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is that spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, <laughs> we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And Jesus Christ is our hope. 
dear friend. So we we got ourselves a conundrum here about the Sermon on the Mount, don't we? Yeah, and especially with the Our Father. Okay? The Our Father is a Jewish prayer for Jews. Okay? And verses 14 and 15 here, okay? Uh, while we're here, uh, go to Mark chapter 11, by the way. Go to Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Okay? Mark chapter 11, 25 and 26. Uh, and when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against as any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither, but if ye do not forgive, neither will your, your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. What do you do with that? Hmm? What do you do with that? See, today, today, you do not have to forgive someone and go to heaven. What happens if you don't? <laughs> ask, uh, oh, ask a couple of people that I know, but what happens if you don't? You become bitter. Your fruit stinks. You become of no use to the Lord. Okay? You become crass. All right. It will not affect your salvation, but it will affect your testimony. It will affect your relationship. It will affect your walk with the Lord. In order to be saved doesn't mean that you have to forgive someone what they did to you. Okay? To be saved today, you have to be broken of your self-righteousness that you are a good person. You have to take responsibility and accountability that it's your fault that he died and went to the cross because of your sins and you better have the hell scared out of you and be afraid of him and call out on his name, call on him for his mercy and hopefully if you are truly broken, contrite and have to fear the Lord, he save you, okay? Okay, because you come to the Lord on his terms and you are truly broken, you truly are repentant of your self-righteousness and take responsibility and and have scared to death of the Lord and you call out on him for his mercy and he save you, you're once saved, always saved, okay? But see, you forgiving someone isn't a requirement for salvation or to stay saved or be saved. But what, it hap what will happen is that will affect your relationship with the Lord, okay? All right? All right? It will, it will affect your relationship, your walk, your living testimony. It could tear up your gut. All right? It will affect so many other aspects. But it will not affect your salvation. And those who hold on to grudges, who dig up the past, right? You stupid bloke, right? Uh, who live in the past, who can't get over these things, who don't go onward, what kind of fruit do they have? Bitter, angry, hateful, hating one another, not putting on the new man. Okay? That's what happens if you don't forgive someone today, but it doesn't affect your salvation, dear friend. The kingdom of heaven, which the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for, if you don't forgive people, you will not be forgiven. Hence, the kingdom of heaven is all works, dear friend. The Sermon on the Mount is for the kingdom of heaven. It's all works. That's why these Christians like it, because it lifts up them. I, you know, for example, the, um, the Alcoholics Anonymous, what would they do? At the end of their meetings, used to be, they would do what? They would recite, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay? Now see, this is a pattern. Our instruction in righteousness. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Okay? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Okay? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Lord, 
Thank you for today. Thank you for giving me the gift of today. You have something for me to do today. What is it you want me to do? Okay. Yes, that pattern. But the exact actual words themselves. It's a Jewish prayer for Jews. But see that pattern again. Okay. But see, the, as we already saw in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit will guide us in prayer. Okay. This is a Jewish. I've known people whose prayer life consists of them only reciting the Our Father. It's like, did you pray it all to him? Yep, I recited the Our Father. And see, you just reciting that. You, you, dear friend, could possibly make it vain repetition, couldn't you? Think about that. Think about that. Okay, because if you're reciting it and call, well, that's all my prayers for the day. Our Lord, as in Romans chapter 8, our Lord wants a living relationship with us. And it's a, it's a, a dialogue between you and the Lord in prayer, not a monologue. Okay, and this is a Jewish prayer for the Jews. Okay, but see, people today, they can recite that just to recite it mechanically. Hence, it will become vain repetition. Can you imagine that? I've known people. Well, yeah, I pray. I say the Our Father uh, seven times a day. Really? That's, well, yeah, that's how we're commanded to pray. So that's all you pray is the Our Father. Now look, if you want to recite the Our Father in your prayers, go ahead. Go ahead. But see, to say that it's doctrinally for us today. No. It was and is a Jewish prayer for the Jews. All which all has to do with the kingdom. And we're not building a kingdom today. I've known, I've known that, you know, in church buildings, they all mechanically recite the Our Father. Okay? I've known people. It's like, I've, I've prayed today, yeah. I've said the Our Father sometimes today. I, I pray sometimes today. Good. It's like, yeah, I pray the Our Father. Is that it? Yeah, that's how we're supposed to pray. Oy vey, man. And see, having a prayer life where you're just reciting something, even the words of God, without having any of that of the heart, you make the word of God of no effect by your tradition, Pharisee. Imagine that. Making the word of God, the Our Father, beautiful, of no effect because of your tradition. Think about that. And like I said, if you want to recite the Our Father, go ahead. Go ahead. But if that is all your prayer life consists of, it's in context of, for the kingdom of heaven. It's a Jewish prayer given unto Jews. Okay, and okay, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verses 4, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Okay, it's likened onto works. Okay, so you got to be careful. I have heard of, and I know of these Christians in the building. That their prayer life is just, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be. And that's it. And they go on living like the devil uh, the whole rest of the week. And the one day they put on their ties and look good and smell good and go to their church building and, and God loves you. And they go and all they do is recite the Lord's Prayer. They, as they say, they are Father. And this is not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is John 17. Okay? All right? Instruction on righteousness is here. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. We addressed that at the beginning of this video. But doctrinally, okay, if you are just limiting yourself to a prayer of just reciting the Our Father, like the Catholics do, the Catholics, the Pharisees, who have, who have, um, who have made void the Word of God by their tradition. Okay, uh, Mark chapter seven. Mark chapter seven, <clears throat> verse nine. Uh, and he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye, the Catholics, with the Our Father. Like I said, in their catechism, they got like a whole chunk of the catechism uh, about the Our Father. Okay? And the Catholics do vain repetition. So, what, what they teach about the Our Father prayer, which is a Jewish prayer for Jews, and remember, they are replacement theology. They think they have replaced the Jews. They, the devil and his church, making the word of God of none effect through their tradition, through your tradition, and turning the beautiful words of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, the Our Father, into vain repetition. Do you get it? You just reciting that and not having a vibrant prayer life with the Lord, you're missing out on many things. Because, dear friend, the Our Father is a Jewish prayer given unto Jews. Nowhere else are you commanded to say anything in like manner. you got to remember, that was in and and, and Matthew and also in Luke. That was done while under the law, while he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jews. Okay. Hey, look, if you want, like I said, you want to recite the Our Father, go ahead. But if that's the limit of your prayer life with the Lord, you are lacking tremendously. And you have to remember, that is a prayer for the Jews, not for us today. Okay. And should even the Jews recite that today? Um, you know, like I said, if they want to, but remember, okay, that's not something, it's not doctrinal for us today. It's not. You have to remember that. Okay? But that's going to be it for this video. Um, like I said, so many of these Christians from the buildings who don't rightly divide the word of truth are deceived and thinking that they're doing something good for the Lord uh, by trying to apply things that are for another dispensation and trying to make them valid for today. you got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Okay? So that's going to be it for this video. going to be links in the description box for you to um, consider. Okay? Thank you for watching this. If you do, we love you. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.